I'm very pleased to introduce uh, the last two plenary speakers uh, for this session. The next speaker is Jonah Albin from NVIDIA. Jonah is a Senior Vice President of GPU Engineering at NVIDIA, a role he's had since 2008. He leads the development of next generation GPU architectures. He joined the company in 1997 as an ASIC design engineer. Jonah has authored 34 patents and holds a BS and MS and EE degree from Stanford University. Please join me in welcoming Jonah. Here's the All right. Thank you, Frank. Hi. Thanks. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, so I wanted to talk about AI today. AI is an interesting field, uh, as we've all found recently. Um, and there, there's three things I, I want to talk about. So, so first, uh, you know, the latest AI we'll talk about is generative AI. So I wanted to just, just foundationally introduce that concept and, and uh, what it means to us, um, and a little bit about uh, what, what are some of the things that caused it to show up? It's not just a coincidence that it showed up. I think it showed up related to some of the advances in hardware that have happened the last uh, several years. Uh, and on that, I'm going to talk about some of the hardware that I'm familiar with. Uh, there's, there's many interesting pieces of hardware in this industry, but I'll talk a little bit about the AI supercomputers that, that we've been involved with at NVIDIA. Um, and then finally, I wanted to talk about this idea of actually using AI, right? AI is a really interesting market, and so uh, a lot of us are spending our time developing uh, technology for AI, but it's also a, t a tool that we can use in our own work, and that's an area that I'm very excited about and want to talk about some of the things that, that, uh, that we've been exploring in that area. Okay, so first, uh, generative AI. Um, so, so what, what is what is generative AI, and how is it different from previous uh, AI? So, you know, AI started out, uh, or let's say deep learning, the, the uh, field in AI started out, you know, in its latest form, maybe ten or so years ago, when people started to find that AI was very good at, at labeling things. So, like you show it a picture, and it says there's a duck in the picture, or, or it's a certain kind of dog, or self-driving cars, you identify a car or a pedestrian, um, which was a very, very impressive accomplishment, um, and was uh, enabled by a lot of the, you know, the, the great computing work that had come up to that time. Um, but it turns out there was opportunities to go way beyond that. Um, and by running much more massive models, we now find that AI is able to, to in, in some way that I, I don't think anybody, who, even if someone who claims to understand it, could really actually understand it, is able to basically em embody knowledge in a way that it can now be much more capable of, of, uh, of creating works just from a very simple prompt. So like, you know, you ask her a picture of a duck playing chess, and because this model is basically being able to capture the concept of what a duck is and what chess is and seen lots of pictures, the world is able to assemble this picture um, from scratch, so generate that picture. Uh, same thing with the idea of, of text. So ChatGPT was one of the big models that really uh, took this revolution, this recent revolution off, um, where basically you train this model that you can ask it a question and it's able to basically find the answer just from the, you know, all the mass amount of training work is done soaking up knowledge from, from the internet um, in, in a fairly accurate way. So th this is, th there's a lot of really interesting applications that are opened up uh, by this, uh, by this concept. Um, one of the areas we're starting to see now is sort of a, 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 a next step forward is this idea of multimodal uh, intelligence. So uh, these models are called LLMs, or large language models, and that's based on their uh, history that the idea was you just gave them a whole bunch of text and then they could put out uh, new text. But now we're looking at actually feeding a lot more data into it. So you know, the text is only one kind of data in the world. There's videos, um, there's pictures, there's audio, uh, you know, there's you know, all the, all the fields of science and all the discoveries they've made over the years, and you can feed that into these models. And not only does it make the model more intelligent related to the, the latest, the, the, the new information you've fed it, it also seems to actually make it a better language model is an interesting uh, finding that, that we've had. So basically, you know, this general idea that just the more information you can feed these computers, the more cap capable they get is a really exciting uh, uh, discovery and is really fueling a lot of the, the efforts by all of us in the industry to make even ever larger computers so we can see what, what, what can come next uh, in this area. And one thing I, I, I want to, that I, I think about a lot is, is, is that it, although you see um, a, a lot of the, the press is about sort of, you know, consu let's say call it consumer applications for this, right? Like, uh, you know, 
let's say, you know, like I hear kids in my school, in my kid's school, like, you know, go do it, do it, use it to do their homework now or things like that. I don't know if that's a great application for it, but, uh, um, or, you know, draw pictures or draw emojis or things like that. Um, there's actually a, a lot of applications that you can think of in, in the uh, industrial space, in the engineering space. Um, th th I'd say these are still early in terms of how they're coming along, but, you know, the idea of, of summarization, I think, is a, is a uh, capability that actually is really interesting in industry. I'll talk about that a, a little bit later. Um, coding, you know, it, this, it's a little bit of a, of a dream, but many people are actually using it for certain kinds of coding now, where instead of having to, you know, type in all the specific uh, things that you're trying to accomplish, you can give a prompt to this, this uh, program and it, it'll, it'll spit out code for you. Uh, and there's there's more applications we're looking at going forward, uh, uh, chemistry, biology, other areas like that where we can use generative AI. So I think this is a, this is a really cool field. It's, it's a field that also uh, is a little bit less complicated. You know, there's a lot of complicated issues around uh, bias and other things like that in some of the consumer applications. In the industrial applications, those issues are somewhat less is what I would say. You know, the, uh, the, the concerns we have are more about uh, you don't want it to make up an answer, right? If you ask it, the, ask it about how your chip works and it makes up an answer, that could be bad because then your engineers are not going to understand things correctly. So there's interesting problems um, in this field. Uh, the, I'm going to segue now to architecture. So as I alluded to in the beginning here, one of the things that's happened here, these aren't just different models. These are much, much larger models. And if you, if you were to plot sort of the size of the models that exist in the industry over time over the past eight or 10 years, you'll see relatively small models with say tens of millions of parameters like ResNet 50 that were established before really started seeing custom hardware for AI. And then I think not coincidentally, right after, the, right, right after much more custom hardware like NVIDIA's Volta is one example, TPUs from Google showed up, um, you actually saw an inflection point where actually the model started getting a lot bigger, a lot faster. Um, and GPT-3 came out uh, maybe like four years ago or so. And then since then you've seen this really very interesting and rapid pace of, of improvement. Um, and I, as someone that builds hardware, I'd like to, th I, I do believe the hardware was an important part of that. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a bit about the, the architecture uh, of our GPUs now. Um, so you, you, w one thing I'll, I'd say about this guy, you, you don't, I don't want to over, it's important not oversimplify AI. You know, the AI, when it came out, people were like, well, it's all this, ma all this math. So basically it's just all about math. Um, but that's actually definitely not true. Um, and I, I really want to emphasize at this conference, because yeah, I know uh, many of you work in other fields like, like IO and analog design, that, that sort of thing. Um, you know, this is a, at the end of the day, this is a massive data center scale computer problem at this point. And in every aspect of technology, it's, it's getting stressed by this, whether it's, of course, the compute side, um, memories, the interfaces to memories, high bandwidth, HBM is really the standard in this space and is continuing to aggressively uh, drive forward to you know, bandwidth levels I don't think any of us could have imagined uh, you know, 10 years ago from a DRAM. Uh, I/O speed and 30 speed is incredibly important, right? None, none of these none of these applications run on a single chip. They're all running on tens of thousands of chips, and fundamentally, there's an enormous amount of communication going on all the time uh, in in these systems. And I think you've seen in the industry the you know the advance of PCI Express, other standards like that. Really, AI is driving this push uh, for uh, you know, just the fastest series we can possibly build and then figure out what the fastest one is uh, after that, uh, after that comes through. Um, I'll also mention other areas like uh, uh, packaging, cooling, these are all challenges, right? We're building these chips that are just you know, physically bigger than you've ever seen before, packaging a whole bunch of them into a very dense system, uh, figuring out how to cool it, make sure that, that it's reliable. Uh, there's there's t tons of challenges there. And then uh, in another area which I think I'll, I'll get into a little bit later also is, is there, there's a lot of other aspects of data center scale design beyond the chips and, and the systems. Um, one is just the ability to assemble these systems, the ability to operate these systems reliably, the ability to service them uh, is, is a huge challenge, right? You're running this one application across tens of thousands of chips, and if any one of those chips fails, the application is going to stop, and then you've got to go figure out how to start it up again, right? So there's a, there's a huge uh, um, stress for everybody no matter what component you're making in the system, to think about the reliability of it, uh, to, you know, to think about how to repair it very rapidly if it, if it goes wrong. So it's, this is a, a field that just, I think, you know, basically all, all the work that all of us have done 
in all of our careers at some point it is, is expressed at some point in the work that, that's being done here. And, and hopefully you, many of you have seen that in, in terms of your company's work recently. I'm going to segue to our, uh, our, our GPU. Uh, as I said earlier, it's, it's just one of the pieces of the system, but it's one I know very well, and, and, and so I thought I would, would talk about that. Um, it, GPUs have evolved over the past several years to effectively be AI processors. Uh, they, they, you see GPUs in other areas, but if you think about it in the AI space, uh, we've really customized the GPU to, based on the AI workloads, and I'll I highlight a couple of, of three areas which I just I mentioned earlier. You know, one is just the processing. So NVIDIA uses a term called SM for streaming multiprocessor um, for our processor engines. You basically have a, a giant sea of these processors and these chips connected by very high speed signaling um, inside, inside of the chip. So uh, crossbars, on-speed buses, how to signal you know, very efficiently across chips is a really interesting uh, and important topic uh, in AI. Uh, and then as I said before, connecting to these HBM memories, the, the amount of data that has to be sucked into these chips in order to do all this compute is, is enormous. And without HBM memory, we wouldn't be able to do uh, the, the work that we're doing about the advances in HBM memory. HBM 3E is the latest. Probably there's going to be more and more after that, um, but that's the latest one that we're running uh, these days. Uh, and then on the IO side, you see people typically use a hybrid of IOs. So there's, there's commonly going to be like a networking IO, like InfiniBand or Ethernet connected. Um, but for maximum bandwidth, use, those usually have too much overhead for, for the extremely high amount of bandwidth you might want to see between a small group of chips within a system. Um, so uh, NVIDIA has a, a IO called NVLink, uh, it's about 900 gigabytes a second, so getting close to a terabyte now, a second of networking bandwidth that basically within a group of eight GPUs in a system, you'll see them all connected together. You know, we use copper signaling because it's you know, lower power than optics, uh, more reliable than optics. So within that, within that, uh, that block of eight GPUs, we're able to run it at very, at very high speeds with, with this interface. Uh, going into the SM uh, in a little more detail, so an, an S, a streaming multiprocessor, is, it, it's a processor, you know, like CPUs, other things are processors, but it's, it's very specialized. Um, it's got really sort of two things it has to do at once. So one thing is, uh, which is kind of the new thing, is, is what we call tensor cores, which is basically the, the core matrix math. A lot of AI is just massive amounts of matrix math turning through. Um, but it's not all matrix math. And it, particularly as you find, as you make the matrix math two times, four times, eight times, 16 times faster, Amdahl's law comes into play. And there's a lot of non-matrix math also in these, in these systems. And so you want a processor that basically can do both uh, simultaneously. And so in this processor, you'll see both these really dense math, uh, matrix math units and also more of a scalar processing system that's able to handle all the other compute that goes on. And they're basically talking back and forth uh, between each other all the time. So that's, you know, this is it. We wanted to build a well-balanced system uh, that's also pretty flexible. I mean, one thing that's happened over the years also is that the models are constantly changing. The models we're running today are nothing like the models that were run four or five years ago. And so having a programmable system is really valuable to researchers. They can invent new models. They don't have to, they find the new models are also able to run well on the hardware and they can keep advancing the, the state of the art forward. I do want to talk a little bit about sort of just like some, a sort of basic technology uh, question that, you know, folks might ask about like what, what is it, what is it, what is it makes a tensor core efficient? Um, efficiency is incredibly important here, right? If we just were 100 times faster, we were 100 times more power, that wouldn't be that helpful. Um, so it's not just about making the systems bigger. We, we are advancing the, te the technology used in them. And one of the key areas, whether it's a TPU from NVIDIA or NVIDIA's GPUs, you see everyone um, doing this is taking advantage of the fact that matrix operations are, actually have some uh, extra locality beyond what you'd think of in a normal compute operation. So a normal you know, a processor would say, I'm gonna do a multiply and an add, and I'll read from registers, get the result, put it back in registers, and I keep going one operand at a time. But if you look at a matrix operation, there's a huge amount of sharing going on. It's so like in this simple four by four example, these, each of those A inputs is gonna be used for four 
against four B values to produce an output, and the same thing for the for the B values. And so, if you do a traditional processor constantly reusing those values, you're going to pay a lot of power, and you're going to go and you're going to cost a lot more area. Whereas if you build a more dedicated unit that basically says all it's going to do is is matrix operations, it knows it's doing matrix operation. You can build all the buses, the register access, everything for that specific use case, and you gain a lot of efficiency out of that. And that's really th this is. This is not, not a new observation, actually. This slide came, I think I took from a 2016 presentation that NVIDIA made. But uh, things like this are what's important to keep driving uh, forward, is look at this, this use case and find special ways to, um, uh, to adapt it for the, for the application. And as I mentioned, that was actually a picture from 2016. So NVIDIA is now in our fourth generation of, of tensor cores here. Uh, and in addition to making the cores themselves more and more efficient, we've also uh, found a lot of opportunities to innovate in mathematics. If you think about HPC, sort of the rule over the years was there's IEEE FP64, everybody has to produce exactly the same answer, you know, it has to be very precise, and that's where the world came from. And if you think about like the exascale computers today, you know, they're still defined in terms of FP64 compute. But it turns out that AI is just a different kind of compute. It does not need that level of precision. You know, the uh, I don't want to make too much of a, of a, of a metaphor for, for neurons, but if you think about like, you know, a neuron in a, in a, in a brain, you know, it's, it, it's sort of like, you know, storing, you know, not super precise information, right? Like it's, you know, is this definitely a cat or not a cat or something? So you don't need FP64, you don't even need FP32. As we've gone further and further, we've gone to the point of basically effectively inventing custom number formats. So these are, none of these are IEEE formats, but they're using the concept of having a floating point range and having some mantissa and squeezing all of that down to sort of the bare minimum that's needed uh, to train these AI models. And we've actually found that we can all, go all the way down to 8-bit now um, and, and train the largest models that exist with 8-bit with precision. Um, and th again, the benefits of that are for energy efficiency are extraordinary. If you think about 64-bit versus 8-bit, you know, that's a factor of 8, but then you think about the multipliers in there actually a factor of much more than 8. Um, so this, is, this has really been a, a critical area of innovation and one that we will all want to keep, keep innovating on. Uh, going forward. So you put the combination of those things together, inventing tensor cores, um, innovating in mathematics, also just making the chips enormously large, and you see this huge shift from 2016 to 2022, where in 2016 the state-of-the-art computer at the time was about 20 teraflops, now it's about 4,000 um, teraflops, so just, just six years we've come an amazingly long ways. Um, and I, I, I did, you know, Although I mentioned those those innovations, also you know the you know, sheer scale also matters. You know, we, we, it's, it's, you, you forget uh, after you've done it for a little while how, how you know when I started in the industry we made much smaller chips. Now we're not intimidated in make, making 800 millimeter squared chips. But um, if you if you think about it a little bit, it probably would be um, intimidating. But you know, there's there's a lot of design work that has to go into building a chip that can yield at that size, um, and then of course connect all of them together uh, at, at scale is, is a great challenge. Um, one, one area I want to also talk about sort of moving out from the chip, I'm not going to go all the way out to the whole system, but I mentioned earlier this idea of, of the interconnect between the chips. The, it, it, we have a chip called the NV switch chip, which is this chip that connects, all, connects the GPUs together um, in our system. And this is, again, a, a very important chip in its own right. Uh, in the early days of AI, we just connected the chips together directly, um, but we really found that wasn't adequate. You, the, the communication patterns in AI are general. You need to be able to talk, and maybe you need to send all your bandwidth from one GPU to another or spray it across all of them. So having sort of like a point-to-point -point type connection wasn't, wasn't gonna do what we wanted it to do. Um, and we basically built a, this custom, uh, custom chip, which this is the third generation, that does the connection between, between the GPUs. Uh, one difference between this chip and a traditional networking chip is it's basically actually communicating effectively memory transactions. So uh, you don't have to go to POCUS CPU to start a DMA request. Basically any one of those processors I showed earlier can just directly go out and issue a request that'll fly out to another, another GPU in the system and come back. So you know, very low latency and very low overhead, um, which is important because if you're communicating at 10 times the bandwidth of uh, a, you know, a, a traditional networking interface, you also need to think about how to do that efficiently. Otherwise, otherwise you're going to be paying power in area um, for that. So uh, this chip is using you know, 50 gigabaud signaling, you know, the highest speed uh, that we have operating today. Um, 
it has it has in, in memory or sorry in, in switch computing, which actually helps with some of the some of the uh, um, communication formats that, that that happen in the chip. And we basically have many of these inside of every system, along with our hopper uh, GPUs. So we put all this all this together, and it, you know, as I said earlier, we don't think of it as a chip. The, 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 we don't think the computer is a chip. The computer is the whole data center, and so EOS is our latest uh, data center that NVIDIA has built for our own work. Um, and if you look at that that data center, as I said earlier, you know, in the HTC space, we're, they're just getting to one exaflop. In AI, we're above 40 exaflops now, so dramatically larger. And again, that's because we're doing a different kind of problem than an HPC uh, uh, system is used to is used to doing. Um, FP8 is uh, precision, for example. We have almost a petabyte of HPM memory distributed across those systems, a massive amount of memory bandwidth, uh, and this whole computer will operate to, to solve one giant AI training problem, one of these large language models uh, that, that we showed earlier. And this is one way to express what you can do with that. If we look back to Selene, which was an earlier generation system that we built, and look back at GPT-3, which, as I mentioned, was a 2020 era model that was trained, you know, that model might have taken 1.6 years to train on one of those older systems. Well, it would only take eight days to train on this new system, but that's actually not that's not why people care about these new systems. It's not because they want to take these old models and train them in eight days. It's because of the new models that they're doing. Um, I think that actually just one interesting thing this week, you know, uh, OpenAI announced this model called Sora, which is really cool. You should check that out. Uh, basically, you type in a prompt and it actually can create a whole video now. So you, know, you see these breakthroughs coming up every few months where somebody has some amazing new model that's, that's, that's been using one of these systems to, to train it. So you know, if, instead of training a little model in eight days, maybe you can train a hundred times bigger, you know, a 10 times or 50 times bigger model now um, and, and see what, what that can do. We're also seeing industry, 10,000 is actually not you know, the future, right? We're seeing people in the industry talk about 30,000 or beyond in terms of the scale of GPUs. This, this plot shows NVIDIA's MLPerf submissions going from about 1,000 GPUs in 2019 up to 10,000 uh, GPUs now. But yeah, commercial scale is, is I, I think we have a site to paper from this one from Meta uh, talking about scale going above 30,000 GPUs. And one of the things, uh, I guess I'll, I'll go back to what I talked about early in the talk about reliability here. Um, so like you think about a laptop, you say, well, you know, imagine if a laptop only crashed once every five years. That would actually be pretty amazing, right? I don't know about you. My, actually, my laptop literally crashed a half an hour before I gave this talk, and I just rebooted it. So, um, so, so five years would be amazing, right? But uh, at a scale of over 30,000, if those computers crash every five years, it means that whole, that whole 30,000 computers can crash every 90 minutes. So it's just a totally different mental model of computing in this space. Um, and as I said earlier, that's, that, that's, this, that's this, un, this underlying pressure that's stressing all of this computing system and really how do you design a system for reliability, whether it's you know, the, the I.O., you know, how are you protecting the I.O. data, you know, a very unlikely event in, in the I.O. of an error might actually be a likely event in one of these systems. So at every, at every part of the system, we have to think about that. So for the last part of the talk, I wanted to segue to actually using AI. So you know, it, it's very fun to build computers for AI, but it would be a pity if we just built them for AI and didn't try to use them ourselves. And I'm going to talk about a couple of uh, areas of work that NVIDIA has done here. Uh, the, the first one, this, this is actually from a couple of years ago. This was uh, a work we did called Prefix RL. And the idea here was, on the one hand, uh, Arithmetic is in adder, adders are like one of the foundational necessary things in a, in a chip, and we've been putting adders in our chip since the dawn of time, right? And EDA companies have been working on optimizing those adders since the dawn of time. But there's so many of them that any, any improvement in that area would actually make a huge difference for the, for the results in terms of a chip of this scale for AI. And so we said, let's, go, let's try throwing AI at the problem. So reinforcement learning basically is a method in AI where you uh, have it try a bunch of random things, and if one of his random results looks, looks a little better, you sort of encourage it to try to go in that direction and go seek more results in that space, and you just let it keep iterating. And what we found is that uh, with this method, we were actually able to beat the state of the art across the entire Pareto optimal curve compared to the EDA tools that we were using. And we got, let's say, up to 25% lower area um, for a given delay. And of course, that also means you're, you're saving power um, as well, as well as saving area there. And when we look at Hopper, we used a, we used this pretty pervasively across the design. So this is this is a, maybe a, a baby version of generative AI, but it was still pretty exciting uh, for us. It was one of one of our first uses of AI inside of NVIDIA. 
now we're starting to look at, at, at this large language models and how large language models can help uh, the work that we're doing. The, you know, our goal isn't to ask large language model, you know, tell us about you know, the history of uh, um, nuclear energy or something like that. It's actually, we want to try to use it for our own work. Um, and what we do for that is we start with what's called a foundation model, which is trained on internet data. So this model is trained on lots and lots of data, which makes it able to generally understand language very well. And it understands a lot of random trivia that we might not care about, but that's embedded in its understanding of language. It doesn't necessarily understand our chips. And the idea is, is the next step, we then do what's called the domain adaptive pre-training, where we, where we grab together all the data we have in our own company, our source code, our documents, uh, you know, our bugs from forever, and we go feed that into the model as well. And based on that, now the model is able to absorb actually the knowledge of our own company. And now it can, we can use it for, for our work in, in, in some way. And there's a couple of ways we're, we're, we're trying to use it. I, I think one, one, one thing I'd say is that you know, it's, it's good to dream big, but I think it's also, our philosophy has been to dream big, but start simple. The, you know, th there's an idea that someday you can imagine, you know, that people will just type in like, give me the best chip in the world and boom, some AI will just do all the work. You can go have some coffee and I'll spit it all out, right? Um, but you don't, uh, it, if you, if you shoot for that, number one, it's probably going to be difficult. And, and just using AI at all is a big difference from not using it at all. And so we try to think about what are some of the most basic things we can think about that are likely to work, try to get those working, and then we can build on that from there. Um, and there's, there's kind of three fields that we talked about in, the, in a paper that we published recently. Uh, one is this idea of, of, of a chat bot, which you can kind of think of as a... Uh, um, and this, this example is, is, is sort of uh, generic, but... You could ask it not just about um, a generic engineering problem. You could also ask it about, about information in your company, right? All of us are building complicated systems, and we have the information about those systems embedded in people's brains, embedded in documents spread around everywhere, and you have to go ask people uh, all the time to figure out what's going on. And it would be very exciting if you could ha have AI soak up the knowledge of your company just like it soaked up the knowledge of the Internet and be able to just ask it. Uh, and so this is, you know, the idea of this chat bot is that maybe we have some new college grad that wants to understand some design they've been assigned to. Could they ask this chat bot to explain it to them or tell them where to look for more information about it? Uh, and that, that could be a really powerful and useful uh, practical day-to-day -day thing. It's not actually doing your job, but it's helping you to learn more rapidly than you could otherwise. Another area we've been looking at is, is EDA scripts. So we, have, we all have wonderful EDA software that we use. It all has, it, they all have this you know, somewhat unusual bespoke languages for spitting out um, their work. You're oftentimes not asking it to do a very complicated thing, um, but you have to remember how to do it in all the syntax of, of, this, of this language. And so by feeding the script, example of scripts into uh, LLMs, we're actually able to have it spit out the scripts for us. And, it's still a good idea for the engineer to read through the script a little bit to go see, you know, if there's anything obviously wrong with it. But he can get you 99% of the way there. That's that's a super useful uh, starting point. And then a, a third area is is bug summary. So I, I don't know about your companies, our company. We do unfortunately have bugs in our chips when we're designing them. Um, and you know, the the process of figuring that bug out is 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 a, takes a lot of the engineer's time, right? You find the bug, you don't really know exactly what's going on with it yet. You start debugging it, you pass it around, there's like 50 or 60 comments as people are trying to figure it out. Um, and then the, a, you, a new person comes in, they have to read through all that stuff. It's very inefficient. Um, you can beg the engineers to go redo the summary based on what's been learned over the past couple of weeks, but they typically don't want to do that. Um, and so it's, it's very tedious. And this idea of summarization is actually a really powerful capability that LLMs have that if you give them a bunch of text, they can typically come up with a pretty good summary of it for you. And so we're looking at that also now, or basically we can take all of our bugs and feed them an LLM, ask the LLM to summarize for us. It'll look not just at the original information, but at all the history of people have added comments to it. Um, and the idea is to spit out uh, you know, a pretty good summary uh, for, for, for people. It, the biggest challenge, I think, in all of these is, is about um, uh, not wanting the LLM, LLM to make stuff up, right? LLMs are happy to make stuff up. Um, and you know, if they make up the summary or if they make up the wrong answer of an engineering thing, that's, that's obviously going to be bad, right? So in order to use this pervasively, we really need to make sure that we can have like 99.9% .9 confidence that it's not making stuff up. And I think that's, that's actually the big area. It's not, not getting it to make interesting answers. It can make interesting answers very easily, but making answers that are reliable is, is one of the biggest challenges uh, that we're working on here. But this is very exciting and just getting this stuff 
going and starting to use AI, I think is going to get everybody thinking about the next thing after that. It's easier to go step by step than just sort of either wait for somebody else to figure everything out for you or go for some big uh, uh, dream that might be hard to, to achieve in one step. So, so wrapping up, uh, you know, what, what are some takeaways? So generative AI is, is a super interesting field. It's interesting for uh, consumers. It's got a lot of hype for consumers, but I really would encourage us to think about it as a tool for our own work um, as well. Um, it's been enabled by the work that we do. It wouldn't have showed up, I don't believe, if we hadn't done all the work over the past several years to make these, these powerful computers. Um, and so you know, now we got to go make even more powerful ones to, to go figure out the next level uh, of things. So it's, so it's just getting started, um, and I can't wait to see what comes out in the next couple of years here. So, okay. thank you.